happen. All right, so let's talk about subways right away. You had a big announcement. Uh, yeah. You talked about funding, taxing the 1% mm -hmm. um, for a little bit more to fund the MTA. That's right. Um, as you know, Albany's not so crazy about the idea. Uh, they're talking about resurrecting congestion pricing. Your feeling on that? Well, first, on why we should have the millionaire's tax, because everyone knows the MTA is in trouble. Uh, it's been decades, I think, since the MTA was this bad, and it's been a crisis, particularly the last few months. I hear it from New Yorkers all the time that they're late to everything. They're late to work, they're late to a job interview, to get their kids after school, to a doctor appointment. We've got a crisis on our hands. Now, the state runs the MTA. This has been something I've talked about a lot, and I think people are really getting the message. State is responsible for the MTA. Governor is responsible for the MTA. They need to step up more, in my opinion. But we do have a long-term problem we've got to fix. The MTA needs a lot of investment. I think those who have done really well, the 1%, the folks who individuals make half a million or more, married couples make a million or more, can pay a little bit more so that the subway can work for everyone. That's the way forward. Now, I know there's been other things talked about in Albany. Would but you be in favor of congestion pricing? I've always had a lot of concerns about it, to be honest with you. I've never been in favor of those proposals because I haven't seen one that I thought was fair, particularly to folks in the outer boroughs. Now, the other fact is that these proposals to date never had any political viability. The last time I think it was attempted was you know, 10, 15 years ago and went nowhere in Albany. So I don't really see a scenario where that gets taken seriously. but. We know something like a millionaire's tax could pass because there already is a state version. I and know, this but would be not, there's a it. lot of people who are not saying that they're going to, you know, support this. Joe Loda, first of all, says, and he's well, running the MTA right now, he's saying basically, I need the money now. I can't wait for a year from now. And Joe Loda does need the money now, and he can get that money from the state of New York that took literally $456 million of MTA money they took from the MTA and put into the state budget for other uses in the clear light of day, the state of New York needs to just give that money back. That would literally solve Joe Loda's immediate problem, according to Joe Loda's own numbers. So look, we're, you know, we're not fools here in New York City. When we see someone take money they're not supposed to take, they got to give it back. You know, some people say that the, the city has $4 billion in surplus. Why not use part of that money right now to solve the problem? Because if we give away more city money to the state of New York, and then we have huge budget cuts from Washington, which unfortunately are very likely. We're going to be left holding the bag. We're going to have to make tough choices of what to cut then in this city. I don't buy that. I think if the city of New York is managing our resources very responsibly and carefully, and we're making smart investments in police and education and things that make the city better for everyone, I'm not going to give away money to the state when the state, in fact, once again, took money from the MTA. This was tax money meant specifically for MTA. It was literally mandated to go to the MTA, and they diverted it to other things. Let's talk about you and the governor. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do you see, foresee any time in the future maybe getting along a little bit better? I've always said that it is about uh, each issue that comes down the pike. For example, we did work very closely uh, at the end of the legislative session in Albany on mayoral control of education. But, but it's issue but by issue. I know, but I, but I feel like, in general, people feel that you and the governor don't get along, and it may be to the detriment of the people of New York City, even on the subway situation. No, I disagree. I'll tell you why. It's true that there are times we don't get along, because I follow an idea that Ed Koch first laid out. When the governor of New York does something good for New York City, praise him, support him, thank him. When the governor of New York does something that hurts New York City, call him out, oppose it, take it on. And that's what I've been doing. But wouldn't you like to have a relationship with the governor where you sit down, you have a glass of wine, a slice of pizza, and kind of talk things over? Yeah, and look, he and I have known each other a long time. And I've said very clearly to him, and I've said it publicly, do by right by New York City, do the right thing for New York City, and that kind of relationship can happen more and more. But I would not be doing my job for the people of this city if I saw our interests affronted and didn't do something about it. I, look, New Yorkers don't want a mayor who's going to be a pushover when dealing with Albany. Uh, and by the way, again, I'm using the example of Ed Koch, who I think did a lot of great things and stood up to Albany when he thought they were doing the wrong thing for New York City. If you don't stand up to Albany, if you don't stand up to Washington when they're hurting your own people, what good are you? And so, yeah, it'd be great to have a wonderful relationship. Here's the way to have a wonderful relationship. Be fair to the people of New York City. So Cynthia Nixon really wants to run for governor? Well, you have to ask Cynthia Nixon that. 
But did know. you encourage her because... I have not talked to her about it at all. Because I know you don't get along so well with the governor. Well, that's a true statement. And again, I'd like to get along better with him, but that means I want him to be fair to New York City. So, but uh, Cynthia Nixon's wife works for you, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, you're not encouraging through back doors... I have not talked Cynthia to Nixon to run her, for governor. her wife, anyone about it. Cynthia Nixon, if you know her work, has got very strong views and has been an activist for many, many years on LGBT rights, on education, on a host of issues. I respect her immensely. I think she's a really smart and effective advocate. Can she be governor of New York? She has to decide what she wants to do. I'm only saying I think she's a great person. I think she's a great New Yorker who's done a lot for this city. You talked about charter schools and that you got mayoral control over the schools. Um, but there was a little contingency about, you know, the, um, the charter schools. Yeah. That, that was part of the package deal sure. of getting mayoral control over the schools. Yeah. Okay, so Eva Moskowitz is saying basically she's still waiting for approval for 27 openings in schools and already established schools where you have, I think, over 100 empty classrooms. When will you sit down with uh, or, or just, you know, sign off on giving charter schools more space in schools? So we have given charter schools space consistently. Um, Here's where I think there's been a lot of misinformation, and obviously I have real differences with Ms. Moskowitz and you know, political differences, differences of belief, um, but you have to look at the charter school movement as a whole. There's a lot of different organizations in the charter school movement. A lot of them we work with very, very well. A lot of them we've approved space for exactly as they asked. Others have asked for space that we didn't feel we could give them. For example, if someone says, hey, I want to put an elementary school in a high school building, we're not going to do that. Mm. Uh, if they say, hey, I have a school that I want to end up being 1,000 students, but there's only enough room in the building for 300 students, ultimately, we're not going to let them start something that can't grow the right way. So there are differences, but what happens is if we say, hey, your plan doesn't work, the charter school has a right to go through a very straightforward appeal process and they end up getting funding and they can find private space and use that funding. And everyone knows that. There's yeah, but she wants fun she wants to go into the public schools. It's obviously a lot easier to go into already established classes. Yes and no. I'll tell you why I say that. When there's enough space to build out properly, and when it's the right kind of school for what's there, again, if it's the same grade levels and one thing or another, yeah, a lot of times we're able to approve that. But when not, we're going to say, if we don't think something's going to work for the existing school that's there, mm. we're going to say that. But you still get the money. And in fact, a lot of charter schools have told us they're very comfortable getting the money and getting their own space they can run the way they want. So it's a lot more nuanced. She is particularly extreme. Everyone knows it. Uh, but very successful. Look, she has a model that has achieved certain things. There's also a critique of that model that in many cases it has excluded kids who don't take tests that well, excluded kids who have problems with special needs or are English language learners, kids who speak a different language originally. Um, there's a big critique of her model. Uh, there's a lot of other charter schools that approach it differently. I want to be really clear about that. I have seen charter schools, which I really admire, that go out of their way to take on the kids who have some of the biggest challenges. But you think Eva's uh, academies do not? I think there's a real uh, critique out there of how they approach it. I think there's been a lot of documentation of the fact that they don't look kindly upon kids that don't take tests well. Uh, in the public school system, we take everyone. We don't care what your situation is. We don't care how well you take a test. Our job is to help you learn. I, some charter schools do that, others don't. So do you think Eva Moskowitz should start looking at other places uh, to move in? Because she, she says she's waiting on 27 open requests right. for space. And look, there's always a certain amount of propaganda to what she says, so I would discount it immediately. Uh, we will look at every single one. We have certainly granted her organization space in some of our schools where we thought it made sense. Again, in other cases, they've simply gotten the money to go find space for themselves. We'll look at each one individually. But I have long since understood she has an axe to grind politically when she puts out something like that, take it with a grain of salt. Okay, let's talk about the emails that were recently yes. uh, released from uh, your organization. Some of them, a lot of people say, reporters are looking into them very, very closely and say, there looks like, on the surface, a pay-for-play scenario that happens in City Hall. Um, some of the emails, for example, with NY Class, Basically, you were there for us all along. We were there for you to tell this now. After we just spent 500K, is totally ridiculous. Puts us in an impossible situation. We are very upset. Right. Do they have access to people who 
volunteer who give you money for your campaigns, do they have special access and favor with you? No, and I'll tell you why. This whole notion is wrong. Uh, the portrayal of it is wrong. In because, what way? Because it ignores the outcome, which is the thing that people care about the most. How are the decisions made? Are they made fairly? Is uh, someone who you have a relationship with uh, going to get their point across, but also someone you don't have a relationship with going to get their point across, and you're going to weigh them fairly? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's a particular group that didn't like the outcome of something. We did what we thought was right. And if they didn't like the outcome, it didn't matter how much money they gave or where they were politically. And there's a lot of the other situations where emails have been released. Well, first of all, the emails were requested and they were released. That shows there's transparency. The folks but it, who took gave, it took some time to get those sure, emails. Sure, but there's a process with anything like that. And there's a law that says, here's how you ask for emails. And it has to go through a process. And then you get them. And here they are. And all the folks who donated money, that's public record. So look at what they say. People are complaining a lot of times that they didn't get something they want. I think that shows that we're actually making decisions based on the merits. So will you be doing things differently this, this time around? You're running for re-election. Uh, the people who donate to your campaign, will they have that special email to you know, try There's to get no, in touch this with is, you? This is what's the fallacy here. There's no special email, meaning I have people who I know all over the city, community activists, civic leaders, business leaders, elected officials, labor leaders, they all have my email, they all have my phone, people I've known for years and years. And they'll call me and they'll make their case and I'll listen. But I'll make my decisions based on what I think is right. But maybe these people who think that they're giving and donating to your campaign feel like they will have a special relationship with you. Is this about their feelings you? or is this about how government actually works? I don't care what their feelings are with all due respect to them because I'll tell them to their faces, you should be supporting me if you think I'm doing a good job and if you agree with what I'm trying to do. If you don't, don't support me. I'm fine with that. Let's talk about the next four years. Uh, the last four, you came in on universal pre-K. Yes. You accomplished that. What, what, what are your goals for the next four years if you're reelected? Rosanna, I got to tell you, and pre-K has been, I'm so proud of it. It's been such a big success. And it's for everyone. It's for people of all backgrounds, all incomes, all neighborhoods. And it's really worked. 70,000 kids now each year getting full day pre-K for free. The next step is 3K, three-year-olds because you know what's happening with so many families. Uh, people are working longer hours than ever, a lot of two-income families, a lot of people who need help with their kids, a good, safe place to be. And also, we want kids to learn earlier because we know that that's when they can grow intellectually and be ready for the future. So we want to do the same thing we did with pre-K for three-year-olds, and I want to build that out over the next four years. That's one piece. And then when it comes to policing, look, we've had extraordinary success, four years in a row, crime going down. I'm very, very proud of that. Relationship between police and community is really starting to improve because of the neighborhood policing, policing strategy that Commissioner O'Neill was really the architect of. I want to get even better. We have actually the lowest number of complaints from community members against police in 15 years. I want that to go down even more. I want us to get even safer. When you go to sleep at night, do you worry about a possible terrorist attack? I constantly think about the threat of terror. And in fact, when I meet with our police leadership, often in this room each week, we talk about pretty much every single time what we're doing. But I'll tell you what gives me confidence. I think the NYPD has the best anti-terror operation of any police department in the country. And we built it up. You know, there was a lot done previously, and I want to give uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Commissioner Kelly credit because they responded properly after 9-11 and saying, wait a minute, we have to have our own capacity for intelligence gathering because obviously our federal government didn't do enough. But then what we added first under Commissioner Bratton, then under Commissioner O'Neill, is the Critical Response Command, and we beefed up that and the other specialized units. We now have 550-plus officers who do nothing but anti-terror preventing terror, they're trained, they're well armed to handle that. You see them out there in bigger numbers than ever before with a lot of weaponry, with the vests, the helmets, because that's the world we're living in today. So I think we're very, very well positioned to prevent. And I think uh, the bad guys can see it. They can see how prepared New York City is. And that has helped a lot. So do I think about it all the time? Of course. But do I feel confident in the NYPD? Absolutely. Um, the president's coming to town next yes. weekend. Uh, uh, Always an adventure. Uh, so <laughs> uh, sometimes when he's in town, you're out there protesting. 
Are there, is there anything planned for next week? Uh, it's, we don't even know what it is yet, is the answer. You don't know when he's coming to town yet? We don't have the details. The MIPD has been talking to the Secret Service, but it has not been shaped up. And, you know, with this president, it's not surprising he would send out something and then it might change in a lot of different ways. So we don't really know what it is. There's no plans yet. Uh, we're going to make sure we're ready as a city and the NYPD is ready to handle whatever he's doing. Uh, there's a lot to disagree with him on, in my opinion. But what I've been doing more than just protesting is working with mayors around the country. By the way, Democrat and Republican alike, and this is real interesting, a lot of Republican mayors around the country didn't agree with the notion of repealing the Affordable Care Act, and we all worked together to try and stop that, and I'm thrilled because of Senator McCain it was stopped. Uh, we're going to be working Democrats and Republicans together to stop some of the big budget cuts directed at our cities. You know, Rosanna, it's weird. The cities of America are the economic a core of this country more than ever before, but a lot of what's being proposed in Washington would hurt the economies of our city, so it actually is backwards. It's going to hurt everyone. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm working with folks all over the country who can actually help stop some of these bad ideas. Sometimes there's a cause for protest. Sometimes the thing to do is roll up the sleeves and figure out how we win the votes to protect the city. So nothing planned for nothing when the president moment. comes to well, town but next reserving week. my rights. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Wait, let me see. Oh. Have you adjusted to living on the Upper East Side? It took you a long time. You were living in Brooklyn, and <laughs> you still have some roots in Brooklyn. I do indeed. Do you like living on the Upper East Side? I like Brooklyn, and look, I, God bless the Upper East Side and all the other parts of New York City, but look, we're all defined by our neighborhood. My neighborhood is in Brooklyn. It's where my kids were born. I mean, you got to remember, my kids were born about 10 blocks from my house, uh, got married, about 10 blocks from my house in Prospect Park. It's like the last 25 years of my life have been in that neighborhood in Brooklyn, and it's where I'm most comfortable, the same way everyone's most comfortable in But is there not any place that you like to go, you and Shirlane, we hang like out on the Upper East Side? Well, yeah, there's some great places on the Upper East Side. Do you have a favorite one that... I um, very, very, uh, very much like this pizzeria and espresso bar called San Mateo, which uh, the guys from Salerno, I know which one. You like it. You yes, know it. the one on 89th Street, 89th Street, yeah. 90th Street, yeah. or the one on 80th, because there's the, two of them yeah, now. There's two next to each yeah. other. So I go to the one closer to 90th, Okay. and they're from Salerno, and which is not far from where my grandfather comes from. And the pizza's amazing, the espresso's fantastic, they do the, the pizza dough with the Nutella in it. It's good. Which is not something I should be eating too often, <laughs> but if they put it near me, I'm going to eat it. So, yeah, there's some great places. Uh, the Mansion Diner, which is a classic. Which very is good. The they have very good chicken soup there in case you're ever sick. Do you ever call in? Do you and, and the missus ever call, call in to Grace? You mean take out? Is take, that what you're saying? Yes, call in. Like, hello, the missus and I don't feel like cooking tonight. Can you deliver? Uh, we don't. We usually go over there, but that's a great diner. And that family's had that diner for a long, long time. And uh, they make a great uh, raisin bread French toast. Strong Orwasher's raisin bread yes. they use, which is wonderful. Very good. So there are great places on the Upper East Side. I'm simply saying to your question, you know, I feel comfortable in the neighborhood that has been like, where my family, I, mean, I coach Little League there, the whole thing. That's my neighborhood. I like going back there all the time. And that's how I think most people live. So what is that Y have in Brooklyn that you can't find at a Y in New York City? Well, it's really, it really makes sense if you think about it. You know, you know remember the show Cheers? Yeah, everybody knows your name? Yeah. Well, when you, I go to that Y, not only does everybody know my name, but everybody just treats me like a regular person because I've been going there for 20 years. And when you have that experience, you know, this kind of work can put you in a bubble. And you can get very disconnected from the real world. And it's nice to be someplace where you just can be yourself, can be connected to your regular life. And it, to me, it's part of how I keep grounded. It's the place I know, the place that knows me. Everything's normal. And that counts for a lot. You go to some other places, of course, people are going to come up and bring up their issues and one thing. I know that's, that's OK. But if you're trying to just go about your life like a regular person, you want to be where you can do that. Obviously, you know, like so many people have criticized you about going to Brooklyn to work out. And I don't understand that because, first of all, what people should be concerned about again is the results. This is this is where I don't know if it's so many people. Honestly, I have not. I've had uh, thirty-something town hall meetings, and we do call-ins on the radio every week. People mm -hmm. don't talk about it. The, pre the press talks about it. Regular people don't talk about it. Regular people want to know: Are you giving them results? They care about things like pre-K, they care about things like crime going down, they care about getting affordable housing, they care about the subways getting fixed. 
They don't care if you go to the gym. They want to know if you produce for them. And I'm very proud to say this administration has produced for people. If going to the gym is one of the things that allows me to do the best job I can do, I don't think most people begrudge that. I'm sure that you want to probably just put this to rest. Big article today about you taking a nap after Ridiculous. the gym. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Is, is that true? Do you take a nap no. after the gym? No. Ridiculous. And by the way... Maybe you're meditating. Uh, no. I don't have a chance <laughs> to meditate. Is there a couch that you like that you like to put the newspaper There's, over your head? No. This is... Look, I, I've spoken many times about the problem in the New York Post and they just make things up and they're a right-wing propaganda operation and here they go again. You know, nameless sources, which is always a giveaway. It's ridiculous. It's sad. It's sad how much they want to focus on everything negative even when it's not true. That's what they do. I'm ignoring it because it's not true. Quality of life. Yes, ma'am. Can we talk about the traffic, ma'am? Sure. I, I don't know what, what the problem is, but the traffic is really impossible. Oh, I can tell you what the problem is. So we have the biggest population we've ever had. Now it's 8.55 million, biggest population in our history. Most tourists ever, 60 million. That's a good thing on one level. Both of these are good signs on no, one I level. No, I know. The good news is, you know, that's happening right. here in the city. Economy's booming. For those who know something about the restaurant industry, right? Mm -hmm. it, all those tourists, lots of spending, lots of jobs. These are good things. But huge congestion price. Also construction. I was about to say construction. Back. I know. And I know it's good that the people are building in the city and buying in right. the city. The taxi t cab drivers tell me that they think the construction is part of the problem. It's a big part of the problem. So who, like, says yes to all these construction problems at one time? Okay. Well, here's the problem. If you're talking about private property rights and someone has a property they're ready to develop, are we going to say, hey, sorry, you have to wait, you know, a year or two while someone else gets to do theirs? No, the job that the city is supposed to do is figure out with traffic enforcement agents and a lot of other means how to keep things flowing even with construction because the construction is a good thing. Jobs for the construction workers, it means permanent jobs will come as a result. By the way, all that office space that's being created is to try and attract new businesses, many of which want brand new office space. We've got to continue to be a global economic capital. We just did this big uh, rezoning of the east side of Manhattan so we can open up a lot of space, create a lot of new business opportunities and office opportunities there. So this is always going to be a tension. But what we are going to do, in addition to having added hundreds of traffic enforcement agents to try and just move things along, uh, we're going to come up with other measures to reduce the congestion. And, you know, the number one focus in terms of the problem has been Midtown Manhattan. But I can tell you, as someone from Brooklyn, there are some uh, parts of the outer boroughs that have massive congestion problems too yes. and need solutions. So we're putting together a bigger plan to start addressing that. Um, I also have to say, the more we make mass transit a better option. So it's great we have to fix the subways, but let's talk about the other things. The ferry service is really starting to take off. That's going to take people out of their cars. That's a good thing. Uh, city bike obviously has been a success and is expanding. Select bus service. It does take up another lane, but it works a lot better. So more and more people willing to get on the bus, get out of their car and take that option. Uh, and we're looking to do, obviously, light rail. We're looking to do a trolley from Astoria to Sunset Park. All of these are things that, if they work the way we hope, get more and more people out of their car and reduce that congestion problem. Homelessness. Yes. Um, we all see it on the street. Sure. And young homeless, I, I don't know if you've noticed this, especially on the Upper East Side, it's heartbreaking as a parent to go and see these like 20 year olds on the street. It's, it's a mixed bag, I wanna be honest with you. It's heartbreaking when someone is homeless because of a mental health problem or a substance abuse problem. It's heartbreaking when a family is doing everything right and trying to work and they can't afford the rent because the price of the city has gone so high and end up in shelter. There's another thing, and Commissioner Bratton pointed this out. There are some people who choose to panhandle for a living. Really? And yeah, and you see I, them. I, I don't see that. No, we. I we, see really. No, no. There's lots sad of people cases with. cases out there. There's lots of that, but I'm saying there's also some younger folks, and this came up, for example, about Tompkins Square Park recently. There are some younger folks who make a choice, and I don't agree with that choice, and it's a, a legally allowable choice, but we see some of that too. But the folks who have a mental health problem. The folks who have a substance abuse problem, we've done something the city never did before. It's called Homestat, where we send out trained professionals to engage those people and try and win their trusts, because obviously a lot of them are not going to trust people at first. It's going to take a while to develop a relationship. That's what we're going to do more and more to get people off the street who truly are homeless. But I also want to remind people, there are some people just panhandling who do have a home. If we see this reality, too. Uh, it all seems like homelessness, and it's alienating to people. It's uncomfortable, and it's sad. 
But our job is to, for those who truly are homeless, to get out there and show them there's a better alternative. Even if it takes going back you know, dozens of times or hundreds of times to win their trust, we've at least begun to see real success with that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.